Across the reinvigorated Federated Suns, the call goes out. The time has come to retake the jewel of New Avalon from the dragon, and throw back the Draconis Combine invaders. But the demands of war and politics will test the fragile alliance between the first Prince Julian Davion and the Prince's champion Eric Sandoval Grohl, and threaten to renew the chaos they seek to conquer. The Rasselhog Dominion, so long a bastion of stability and internal harmony, greets the news of the Ilkland's accession with anything but a united front. Between those who believe that joining the newborn Star League is the Dominion's destiny, and those not willing to deny the power and promise of their fusion culture, a single vote could secure a bright new future, or ignite the flames of violence. Hello everyone! Today we're going to take a look at the Dominion's Divided Sourcebook from Catalyst Game Lab so that you can make an informed decision if it's something you want to add to your bookshelf, both real and digital. The lore in the book can be broken down into two main sections. First is the war between the Draconis Combine and the Federated Suns, largely focusing on the effort to retake the Fed Sun capital of New Avalon. The campaign was organized by Julian Davion, led by his champion Eric Sandoval Grohl, and subverted by a completely wacky Second Front invasion of the Torian Concordat by Alexander Hasek. Because if there's going to be a running theme in the source book, it's that, when in doubt, start another war. Torinaga, the mastermind behind the Combine invasion of the Federated Sons, ends up stranded on New Avalon, unable to send for help and increasingly isolated. One look at the map shows just how perilous the hold on the Federated Sun capital is at this point. Still, Tornaga puts up a grand fight with the help of the Fifth Sword of Light. Personally, I would have suggested the Federated Suns cut the tongue off at its base and roll it up until New Avalon was entirely surrounded. However, the internal struggles of Fed Sun politics required flashy set-piece battles that get a ton of soldiers killed and so that no one in positions of power can have their feelings hurt or their positions put in danger. The invasion of New Avalon is a bloodbath, and if you want all the details, that's what the novel Damocles Sanction covers, so enjoy all that. I haven't read it yet because time still functions linearly, and there's only so much time in the day for nonsense. On the outskirts of Fed Sun's territory, Alexander Hasek's decision to invade the Torrens follows an assassination attempt that is used as the flimsiest reason to get a bunch of people killed since Malvina's last visit to Terra. Though the campaign against the Torians starts off well, eventually it falls apart and Hasek is captured. Eventually, the Torians ransom him back to the Fed Sons after launching a counter-invasion of their own. Heck, hath no fury like a bull scorned. From the Combine point of view, things are not going well. Sapped of resources, coordinator Yori Kurita calls for mass conscription to create home planet garrison units called Ahigaru that can free up DCMS units for the war effort against the Federated Sons. When word of New Avalon's fall and the death of Poronaga reaches Combine leadership, they are successful in twisting the news in a way that generates support for the regime rather than undermining it. After months of fighting, the border between the Combine and the Federated Sons looks a lot closer to the original, with continuing fighting across border worlds. The second major piece of this source book concerns the choice that the Rasselhog Dominion has upon hearing that Alaric's wolves have triumphed on Terra and announce their intent to reform the Star League. Though this question drives the narrative, what I found uniquely interesting is the description of how Clan Ghost Bear and the peoples of Rasselhog, Combine, and Steiner worlds mesh together into a blended society that shared both clan and inner sphere traditions and social structures. What little of that there is kept me quite interested. What happens with the vote and the resulting nonsense was n less than great. I really want a novel that is based in the Rasselhog Dominion that can dive deeper into that unique meshed society, though I doubt we will considering what comes later. The leaders of the Dominion decide the question of joining the Ill Clan is one that is too big to be made without a vote, so a Dominion-wide election is held to decide if the Dominion should join the Ill Clan or stay independent. The vote ends up being incredibly close, with the faction that wanted to join the Ill Clan winning out. Things were very tense across the region as Rasselhog peoples were fiercely independent and the union with Clan Ghost Bear still felt quite new in the minds of many. With the vote decided, the Dominion was prepared to join the Ill Clan. Now, this is where Alaric, in all of his wisdom, decides to kneecap a possible ally. The vote results are rejected by Alaric, who argues that it's not clear enough indication of a willingness to join the new Star League. This rejection sends shockwaves through the Dominion, as those who wanted to join now feel slighted, and those who didn't want to join are insulted by the entire process, 
and sometimes targeted by those who blame them. Lines are drawn, feelings are hurt, and there's widespread internal strife as a result. Basically, Alaric triggers a civil war in the Rosselhog Dominion because he is so amazingly perfect and always thinking five steps ahead of his opponents, or at least that's what we're told. This is where things sort of fall apart for my attention span as the discussion of conflict over Dominion worlds intensifies. I couldn't keep the names of the faction leaders' participants straight in my head, and honestly, I don't think it matters. Eventually, the cooler heads prevail, but only after about 30% of the Dominion Toolmen is obliterated or has abandoned their duty. Lots of civilians die, and there are significant cracks in a society that deluded itself into thinking that the only threats came from outside the nation's borders. There's a particularly poignant section written as an in-universe editorial on March 3rd, 3152, that I want to share because I think it has something to say about the real world in which we live. I'm going to go ahead and read the whole thing for you now. My neighbor has not been home in six months. The yard is overgrown. The mail is a nuisance. Of course her husband and the kids are gone too. They aren't on holiday or moved away. She is in Kurobane prison. Her husband is too. I am not sure where the kids are. We hope with his family. What was my neighbor's crime? She was publicly known as a joiner. Did she attack anyone? No. She attended a few meetings and decided her family's future would be better if the Rosselhog Dominion joined the Star League. Is this what we have come to? Throwing families in prison because we disagree with them? Neighbors listen at doors to catch each other out? We're told it was necessary to protect Vega from the insanity going on in the rest of the Dominion. But none of that was happening here. Joiners have been swept off the street because of what they might do, not what they have done. The Vega Protectorate exists because when the Republic of the Sphere fell, we chose not to go back to the Draconis Combine police state. The Rasselhog Dominion came to our aid to keep us free. We were not always grateful or helpful, but they stood by their word and allowed Vega a degree of autonomy we never had before. And what have we done? We've turned ourselves into the police state we fought to escape. Being a child of the 1980s, I was raised on a steady stream of science fiction that continually hammered home themes of out-of-control bureaucracies, powerful corporations, and arrogance bordering on madness. It would be easy to look around today and come to the conclusion that those stark warnings were not well heeded. We live in a world where almost every aspect of our lives is now under surveillance, monitored by unaccountable hall monitors, and logged in a corporate database, which the government can access at any time without your knowledge. That being said, we don't collectively have a good track record of listening to warnings and heeding the canary in the coal mine. What this passage warns us about is becoming so zealous in our ideological purity that we lose our humanity. Joining the Ill Clan was a big decision with huge implications, but was winning that political fight worth becoming the monsters you sought to keep outside your proverbial city gates? Now decisions that were made cannot be undone. How, even if the editorial's author's neighbor returns, could you possibly move on from that? Knowing that your neighbors would stand silent and let you be taken away, not for something you did, or even something you said, but for something that you believed. The implied threat would be perpetual. This is why civil wars leave long and jagged scars across a society. The pain and mistrust lingers long after the shooting stops. Maybe that's something to think about. After the bloodletting and conflict calms down a bit in the Dominion, events go off the rails logically. The Dominion Prince, Halmar Miraborg, ends up saying the Dominion will join the Eel Clan eventually, but when and how is put off until later. Then he proceeds to kill Galaxy Commander Lars Magnuson in a trial. The Magnuson was instrumental in ending the internal conflict among the Ghost Bear forces, and the death really comes out of left field. It's not until you read the biography section do you learn that Miraborg saw Magnuson as a political rival. Unless I missed the mention of that earlier, which is possible, that was a strange turn of events. Finally, as if the Dominion didn't already have enough issues, Prince Miraborg decides to launch a war against the Combine to prove the Dominion worthy of joining the Clan. This creates the equivalent of a second front for a severely weakened Dominion force that had just barely kept from wiping themselves out in a civil war. If the goal was to forge unity through focus on a common enemy, 
choosing the Combine, a very tough foe even in their weakened state, is a foolish one. It would have made much more sense to me to ignore the largely peaceful border and focus on the Hell's Horses, who were also weakened from an ill-fated attempt to gobble up a Lyran in Jade Falcon worlds. Narratively, it would have made more sense, and by any measure the horses have it coming. If the goal was to impress Alaric, a winning war against the Hell Horses that had just spit in Alaric's face would be preferable to fighting a losing war against the Combine that would just grind down the Dominion's ability to contribute anything to a future Star League. The sourcebook has all the things you'd expect if you're an owner of the previous Ilkline era books. The faction summaries are decent with some cool unit insignias and patches. The biographies are okay, though there's something about that art style for faces that puts me off. It's a mixture of maybe Uncanny Valley and the abundance of facial blemishes and just that dead eye stares. I don't know. I can't explain it. Just makes it very unpleasant to look at. I really like the planet summaries, the rules for creating Dominion's divided scenarios are interesting, and I'm looking forward to trying out the game with some angry mobs wandering around the city streets. The campaign map is solid and functional, so no issues there. If you're into this campaign stuff, you're going to get more of what you know well at this point. I think my favorite part of this sourcebook is the art. It's really something that Catalyst has nailed in their shift into the Ilkline eras, representing battle mechs in a way that highlights that ultimately they're the stars of the show. If you're an older fan of Battletech, you know that this wasn't always the case. Some of the art in the past has been pretty iffy and downright bad. Or cringe, as the mini mech frog would say before he goes back to his first person shooter. In total, if you want a rundown of events in 31, 51, and 52 and appreciate the art, I'd say the purchase is warranted. If you're on the fence and not really a collector of Battletech books, or you could probably pass on this and fill in the gaps with summaries online. If I have any major concerns moving forward, it's a tendency to rely a bit too heavily on starting new wars as a solution to every problem. Part of the allure of Battletech fictions, the interaction between people, the intrigue, subterfuge, and highlighting the fact that humanity at its core tends to be its own greatest enemy. Though I think we get a hint of that with the Russell Hogg Dominion section, I really want to see more. Something to ponder, perhaps. If you enjoyed this review and want to see more content in the future, like and subscribe so I can be rewarded by numbers slowly moving up. Big thanks to the Ko-Fi subscribers who help keep the lights on around here. Take care and go make the world a slightly better place today and tomorrow.